Hello and welcome to our webinar hosted by scientist.com and presented by Equipped, how preclinical quality certifications help foster biopharma CRO partnerships. Just a few reminders before we begin the, begin the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants and attendees within 48 hours after the event. We appreciate your patience and your involvement. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them by using the Q&A function, which you will see at the bottom of your Zoom window with the large letters Q&A. Our panelists will be answering submitted questions at the end of the presentation. We'll also be making the slides available after we've ended the webinar. First, I will give you a brief introduction to our speakers. Then each guest will present some information on their perspective and approach to preclinical data quality. Lastly, we'll have a live Q&A with the entire panel. Before the introductions, we're going to open up a quick poll question to help us get a sense of your views on the subject matter today. Please go ahead and answer that poll question, which should appear on your screens whilst I introduce today's speakers. My name is Matt McLaughlin, and I am the Senior Vice President of Compliance and Categories at Scientist.com. I've been involved in drug research and discovery for over 20 years. Prior to my current role, I was a Senior Research Scientist at AstraZeneca for 12 years before moving to procurement as a Global Category Manager, supporting preclinical research and human biological sample acquisition. I joined Scientist over five years ago and now head two departments, the Compliance and Categories areas. Within my compliance role, I have built and am responsible for our third party risk management process, as well as designed and implemented our award winning comply functionality to assist in the provision of regulated services. Our first guest speaker is Dr. Thomas Steckler. Thomas is the Associate Director of Bio Research Quality and Compliance at Janssen Pharmaceuticals in Belgium. He's also a project leader at Equipped and a co-lead at the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology. He has co-authored more than 140 peer-reviewed publications, has been a principal editor of the journal Psychopharmacology for several years, is co-editor of a number of books, and most recently co-edited a handbook of experimental pharmacology on good research practice in non-clinical pharmacology and biomedicine. His expertise and fields of interest are drug development, psychopharmacology, quality, animal care and use, and animal models. Our next speaker is Dr. Christoph Emmerich, the Chief Scientific Officer at PASP GmbH. Christoph is a biochemist by training, and he carried out his PhD studies in the fields of cancer biology and apoptosis at the German Cancer Research Center, Heidelberg and at the Imperial College London. His work is published in high impact factor journals and his projects were based on regulatory mechanisms of the immune system with an increasing focus on data quality and integrity standards. To begin with, Thomas will provide information about why biopharma companies want a global standard for preclinical data quality. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm presenting today with my equipped project lead head on. Um, so welcome, everybody. And Matt, if you could just go to the next slide, please. OK. First, I'd like to give you some background why we started the equipped project. And this really related to the fact that many people faced issues when they tried to reproduce what's in the published literature. And just to give you some examples here, and I hope you can see my arrow uh, showing up now. Yes. So here you see an example from Bayer. That's the by now well-known uh, publication from Prince and colleagues looking into various uh, therapeutic areas and trying to reproduce what's in the published literature. And they failed in more than 65% of cases. Having said this, the issue of low reproducibility is not just one that is confined to biomedicine but you really can see it in, in various areas of science. There was a, but also by now, I think, well-known nature publication uh, conducting a survey of more than 2,500 scientists. 
and showing that uh, people working in the field of chemistry, physics and engineering, earth and environmental sciences, biology, medicine, and other areas all faced issues to reproduce what was in the public domain. You can see it also in computerized sciences, like here for artificial intelligence, you see it in the social sciences, you see it in economics, you name it. Everywhere you face issues uh, with reproducibility of uh, published studies. Next slide, please. Well, this is not just an issue that is due to wrongdoing, but uh, it's just a matter of, of probabilities that many of the findings that you can see in the public domain um, cannot be reproduced. And this is very well delineated in by now the seminal publication from John Ioannidis talking about why most published research findings are false. So he talked about the positive predictive value, which is nothing else than the probability that a real effect can be found um, if a significant result has been published. Or the false discovery rate, which is the probability that a real effect does not exist if you have a significant finding. And what you can see is that you have a high false discovery rate, especially if you have small studies with low power and small effect sizes. And I will illustrate this as an, with an example in the next slide. So here you see three panels and let's go to the first one. Uh, assume you have a thousand experiments or a thousand hypotheses and 10% of those hypotheses turn out to be true. Those would be the green squares in that figure, okay? So 10% true findings. If you have a study that has a low power of 0.2, let's go to the next one, um, you will see that out of these 100 green squares, only 20% show up as true positives. So only the 20 on top of this, uh, uh, figure come out as true positives, meaning that 80 of the 100 true findings will come out as false negatives, that's the red squares. If you then set your p-value below 0.05, the famous significant level, you end up with nothing else than 5% of the remaining 900 findings coming out as false positives, meaning you end up with 45 of those findings being false positives, and those are the orange squares in this figure here. Now going to the next part of this figure, assuming that we have a publication bias, meaning that people like to publish the positive findings and just neglect the rest. You see what happens out of a thousand publications, only 65 of the experiments will be published. And those would be those experiments that come out positive. And what you also see is out of these 65, 20 will be true findings and 45 will be false positives. And if you calculate the likelihood that you have a true positive findings out of what's published, you see that you end up with close to 70% of false positives being published. You can improve the situation somewhat. For instance, if you increase your power, if you increase it to 0.8, you will end up with 125 experiments showing positive results and having publication bias being published. But still out of those 125 experiments that are published, 36% will be false positives. So it doesn't come as a surprise that even if everything goes according to the book, everything goes well, you might find it difficult to reproduce what's in the published literature. Next slide, please. Now, there are a number of other things that, of course, can go wrong. Um, and I don't want to go into detail with all the different possibilities. But sufficient to say that, for instance, you can use non-authenticated materials and there was a couple of years ago, a famous example where people uh, used cell lines, you know, where they thought they would test one cell line when it was in fact a, a different type of cell line. 
You could uh, use inappropriate statistics. You forget about randomization or blinding. You <clears throat> remove so-called outliers without pre-specification. Um, of course, you can do some misconduct as well. You know, you can falsify your data or you uh, conduct hacking, which is hypothesizing after the results are known. So there are several factors that come into play and that could all increase your probability of, of false discoveries. Next slide, please. There are a couple of existing quality systems around um, that partly address those issues. For our purposes, most relevant, I think, is good laboratory practice, GLP, and the ISO systems. Now, for GLP, it's very study focused and has a relatively confined range of applications because it looks really into preclinical toxin safety and uh, covers the regulated space here. For ISO, it's broader, it's more generic and process-based, but really it focuses more on, on customer needs and does not address all the issues that we want to address when it comes to good research practice, GRP, which is the uh, um, area that is highlighted here with a gray background. I've also highlighted a couple of things here with a green, the yellow frame. Um, those areas, are, I believe, are covered by those already existing quality systems. But as you can see, there are quite a number of areas that are not really addressed in, in depth with these quality systems. Next slide. And that was the reason why we started up the EQUIP consortium, which stands for Enhancing Quality in Preclinical Data. That consortium kicked off in 2017 and had 30 partners, 10 public partners for academic groups from all over Europe, 12 FPA companies that joined forces, and eight SMEs, primarily CROs, but also learned societies. And over time, we've also built a built a quite a big stakeholder community. We have more than 100 stakeholders globally and five associated collaborators that work with us as we speak. The objective of the consortium really was to create simple and sustainable solutions that helped to improve non-clinical data quality without impacting negatively on freedom of research. And this was a very clear objective set. We wanted to strengthen primarily the internal validity of the data, so the rigor of the research conducted in the preclinical domain. And as an outcome, we developed the EQUIP quality system uh, that was released in October last year. And we are also still busy with developing an online training platform that should be released anytime soon. We are partnering with organizations like scientists.com to distribute and disseminate the quality system as we speak. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, what we have is a situation that we have quality system in existence, of course, like GLP, GCLP, GCP, and so on, that uh, really cover the regulated space, regulated by FDA or EMA. But we are targeting primarily the non-regulated space. So really, when you look at the drug development process, starting off with target selection, hit identification, hit to lead, lead optimization, and eventually going into the preclinical development and safety domain. This is really the area where equipped plays. Next slide, please. No, go back, please. Okay, thank you. So what we aimed at was a quality system that was fit for purpose, and we are focusing here on performance standards rather than fixed engineering standards. Performance standards means that we have the end product in view and uh, did not really care too much about how people would reach that end goal. Okay, so that's up to the research unit. We are not prescriptive in that uh, sense. It had to be a user-friendly system. So we developed a number of supporting tools and guiding information. It had to be lean to really address what's relevant for this individual research unit, because we realized that there's quite a variety of different needs around. And it had to be flexible. So we didn't prescribe any timelines. 
we didn't prescribe any order in which the system had to be set up, but really people could prioritize according to their individual needs. That was very important for us. Next slide. So what we ended up with were 18 core requirements that you can broadly group in six categories around the research team, the research process, quality culture, continuous improvement, data integrity, and sustainability. It had to be flexible to keep the needs of the researcher, of the individual research unit in mind. So really, you can start off with the question of what's relevant for my institution? What's my current funding situation? What does my funder require from me in terms of data quality? What do I have to take action on? What is my collaborative situation? Do I collaborate internally or externally at national level or international level? What are requirements set here? And what is my publication strategy? What does a journal or publisher require in terms of information that I provide within my publication? And based on all these different questions, you can prioritize the requirements you have. And you start with requirement B for sake of argument or A or C or whatever. And then you move down the chain. And it's also up to you to decide of how far you go in that process. And as I said before, we have developed a number of um, guiding mechanisms as well. We have a toolbox, which is essentially a repository developed by equipped with guidelines, recommendations, protocols, links that you can access. We have a planning tool where you can then uh, uh, look for your individual situation and what you need in your situation from equipped. And then we end up with a dossier that's really the user specific outcome of the effort. And I'm ending here and hand over to Christoph, uh, who gives you more information about the equipped quality system. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you, Matt. Um, I would now, now like to focus in more detail on the assessment and certification process to um, actually obtain the equipped quality label. Um, next slide, please. So um, let me start with highlighting a few specific steps related to the assessment procedure. Um, the first step is an optional but um, dedicated self-assessment questionnaire to provide an overview or um, let's say snapshot about the service provider's current quality practices. And it was developed by an equipped working group to really facilitate the interaction between service providers and sponsors. Um, the second step is to get a customized quote and to set up the contract before initiating the formal um, assessment here in step three. Um, and to obtain the equipped certificate and the equipped quality label. Um, we have partnered with scientist.com to streamline this process for you, um, but to also provide you with the opportunity to really maximize um, your visibility by making your achievements visible to sponsors and potential customers or buyers. Um, so if you are registered on scientist.com and you log into your account, you will find a special, a special RFI request for information called Enhancing Quality in Preclinical Data Equipped, um, which is basically the equipped self-assessment. Um, and by filling out this RFI, you can not only learn about equipped expectations and prepare yourself for the formal assessment, but you also have the option to present and share the RFI information with sponsors and clients and this might in some cases already be sufficient to convince um, a sponsor to initiate a new contract. Um, and Matt will have a couple of slides to explain this in more detail at the end. Um, Scientist.com also provides a direct link to get in contact with us to request a quote and to start the assessment and certification process. Um, again, importantly, once the service provider has successfully completed the assessment process and has been awarded the equipped quality label, this will be highlighted on um, the scientist.com platform so that potential buyers, sponsors can see this and can take it into consideration um, when looking for new service providers. 
Um, but I should also mention that it's possible to start the assessment process and to access the equipped uh, self-assessment questionnaire without being registered on scientist.com. So for example, you will find the questionnaire in our equipped toolbox, uh, Thomas mentioned, and you will see the link to the toolbox at the end of the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So there are three options how to obtain the equipped quality label. Um, the first one is for research units which have implemented the fully functional equipped quality system, and the assessment will be based on the full set of core requirements, and the certificate will be valid for three years. Um, the second option is called purpose fit certificate and is really ideal for research units for which implementing the quality system is currently out of scope. Um, and in this case, the assessment focusing on whether current practices are conform with equipped expectations, and we do not take any core requirements into account, which are only relevant for running and monitoring the equipped quality system. Um, and the purpose fit certificate is valid for one year. Um, next slide, please. So there's a third option to obtain the equipped quality label by participating in an NIH supported initiative. Um, this option is basically identical to the purpose fit assessment, but at no costs. And I will explain this option in more detail at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, I want to give you a few examples of core requirements relevant for both the quality system as well as the purpose fit certification and what are our expectations. So for example, core requirement six is about data handling and good documentation practices. Core requirement eight is about traceability. Um, so whether or not it's possible to trace back any process data to the original data. Um, core requirement 11 is about training and competence of scientists and staff members. Core requirement 14 is about the qualification of tools and equipment. And core requirement 16 is about proper error management. Um, so you have probably already internal processes in place to address all or most of these core requirements. Um, and again, more information about the core requirements can be found in the Equip toolbox. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Thomas mentioned before, our aim is to provide solutions that are lean, flexible, fit for purpose, and really not too burdensome. Um, but what does it mean for the assessment process? How do these principles actually come into play? Um, again, to give you an example, Equipped recommends to apply randomization um, to all in vivo studies to reduce the risk of bias. Um, but there's certainly a degree of flexibility in a sense that you as a scientist can still decide and judge if this is also relevant and required for, for the specific experiment you are planning um, to run. Uh, and there might may be some good reasons why randomization is not meaningful in your particular situation. Um, so if you decide not to randomize, then that's totally fine. Um, but this decision should be transparently described, documented, and reported. Um, so transparency is really one of the most uh, important principles within the equipped universe. Um, and one step further, if you do apply randomization, it is up to you how you want to do this, um, what tools you would like to use, um, as long as the goal of having a randomized sequence or let's say allocation of animals to treatment groups is achieved. Um, so for us, it's really the end result um, which matters and not so much how you achieve this. Um, next slide, please. Um, so let's talk about the assessment and certification process in more detail and what the actual steps are to obtain the quality label. Um, next slide. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the first step would be to log into your scientist.com profile, go to the RFI list, and select the equipped RFI. And from here, you are guided through the self assessment questionnaire. Um, importantly, once you have filled out the RFI, your status can be changed to equipped pre screen completed, which can be seen and noticed by sponsors and buyers. Um, so you can use it to increase your visibility. Um, alternatively, um, as step three, it's also possible to contact us and the equip team directly and start the assessment process on your own. Um, now, next slide, please. Um, as a next step, 
we will normally set up a short uh, TC or video conference to talk you through the assessment process, provide you with some general information and discuss your specific situation. Um, so for example, the size of your research unit um, is an important piece of information for us um, so that we can prepare a quote for you. Um, and we will also discuss what documents like study plans, protocols or publications are available, which we can then include in the assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So the main part of the assessment is a questionnaire about quality measures and the equipped core requirements. Um, so basically a more detailed version of the RFI. And we will have a look at the addition documents provided by you. Um, usually the assessment will be done remotely and online, but we will select a small number of research units. So around uh, one in five for an on-site visit. And I will come to that in a minute. Um, so once we have done the assessment, we will send you an assessment summary and then set up um, a TC or video conference to discuss our findings and whether or not there are any recommendations or identified risk factors which you may want to address. Next slide, please. So if everything is okay and any, any recommendations to improve have been implemented, we will send you the final report and will award you with the equipped quality label. Um, again, to increase your visibility and to highlight your achievements, your status on scientist.com can be changed to equip quality label, which can be seen by sponsors and buyers as well. Um, and as I said, Matt will show you how this looks like in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, there are some costs attached to the assessment process, but here I would really like to ask you to please get in contact with us so that we can discuss your specific situation. Um, as pricing will depend on some factors like the size of your research unit um, and location. So please don't hesitate to, to get in contact with us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide is just to give you an idea how much time it might require from your side to go through the different steps of the assessment process. Um, so we estimate that it will take around uh, one hour, maybe less than, than one hour to fill out scientist.com RFI, again, around one hour for our initial um, TC or video conference to discuss your situation. Again, it might take you one hour to prepare um, any additional documents. Um, we estimate it will take around four to six hours for you to fill out uh, the main questionnaire and maybe a couple of hours to discuss our initial findings and any recommendations. Um, so the on-site visit is normally planned in a way that we will have a dialogue with the management team first for around a couple of hours, followed then by one-on-one -on -one discussions with staff members, students, um, and technicians for around 30 minutes each. So normally, again, depending on the size of your research unit, an on-site visit uh, takes around one day. Um, of course, these numbers can vary, but the point I want to make is that the assessment process really won't disrupt your business, your daily work um, too much and should not be too burdensome for you. Next slide, please. Um, as I said before, I would also like to briefly talk about the NIH collaboration. Um, the NIH has awarded us a grant to support the implementation of preclinical data quality standards, which is very much in line with the equipped concept. Um, so for you, that means if you participate, we would basically go through the purpose fit certification process and you would be awarded the same equipped quality label valid for one year. Um, of course, you can use this to demonstrate early leadership in quality by being part of this NIH supported initiative. But the main difference really is that we can offer this certification at no cost for you. Um, it would require that we will share some data about the assessment uh, process with the NIH, but um, of course, no confidential or identifiable information uh, will be disclosed. So if this sounds interesting to you, please contact us as soon as possible um, as the number of participants is limited and we are about starting to fill um, these positions. Next slide, please. Um, at the end, I would like to emphasize again that we, on the one hand, 
want to support you in checking your internal processes and to optimize them if necessary. But on the other hand, we would also like to provide you with an opportunity to communicate to your environment, to your collaboration partners and sponsors that you have implemented all critical uh, quality requirements, that you generate high quality data, and that you are really proud of your work. And, and that's why we have teamed up with um, scientists.com and have created the equipped quality label. Um, and of course, this has some real benefits for sponsors working with equipped certified service providers, um, as this increases their trust in, in data provided, increases the trust, the confidence in a new service provider, and reduces the costs um, for the due diligence process and by avoiding poor services. So that ultimately decisions about a new business relationship can be made faster um, and with less risks. Um, next slide, please. So finally, Thomas and I, we would like to thank the whole Equip team for the great work over the last four years. And we would really like to thank the scientist.com team um, for a very productive collaboration. Um, and we would like to thank you, of course, for your attention. And please do not hesitate to contact us to discuss your specific um, situation. So thank you very much. And over to you, Matt. Thank you, Christoph, and also thank you, Thomas, for both of those uh, informative presentations. What we're going to do now is open up a quick final poll question, so you can understand how you, uh, so we can understand how you intend to use uh, the preclinical data quality standard within your organisation. Um, and similar to what Thomas and oh, sorry, Christoph mentioned at the end there, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask, um, please feel free to enter them into the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen. This will come through to the team uh, and panelists, and we'll be able to answer those as part of the Q&A session that's following up shortly. So as you answer that, uh, I'd like to take this moment to share a bit more information about that supplier self-assessment options that are available through scientists.com. Firstly, I wanted to congratulate the Equip team on the successful delivery of the project goal. Having industry and academia come together to tackle this long-standing issue is commendable. And we as an organization were very keen to support it as it aligns with our core goals of improving quality across the entire drug discovery pipeline. As such, it was important for us to identify ways to support the equipped initiative. And we we're very pleased to offer our comply functionality to do just that. As mentioned previously, to do this, we work with Equip to make the self-assessment available via our request for information functionality. This is now available and live for the over 3,800 suppliers within the marketplace. As with all the requests for information on the scientist.com platform, the Equipped RFI is intended to serve two functions. Firstly, it is a way for you as a supplier to communicate your capabilities, your processes and procedures proactively and directly to your clients to demonstrate your dedication to high quality research and as a tool to differentiate yourselves within the market. Secondly, is a way for clients to proactively review a supplier to prior to contracting work with them, to increase confidence in the capabilities of that third party and work with the best suppliers available globally. We also understand and appreciate that Equipped is an independent organization and that there are providers of services who are not yet part of scientist.com. So, if as a supplier, you elect to complete the self-assessment directly with Equipped, then you're also able to capture this through the self-certification within the scientist.com platform later, if you so wish to join. You can also highlight if you've gone through the entire process and have an Equipped quality label. This is searchable by the biopharmaceutical companies that work within the scientist.com marketplace within their own search functionality and it will enable them to quickly identify suppliers with these quality standards. Now, as mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to submit them in the Q&A box that you can see on your, on your Zoom window. And we've already had a couple that have been submitted, so we're gonna dive straight in. So the first question, uh, and Christoph, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, this is probably gonna get thrown your way. Um, could you provide some examples of a, a red flag, um, for want of a better phrase, or, or the critical aspects related to the quality standard, please? 
Um, yes, um, so there are indeed some some aspects which are critical and and really need to be addressed and we might have to pause the assessment um, until they are addressed. Um, so, for example, to have a written description of all key experimental methods is is a must have um, or to to secure long term storage. Um, of raw data is, is really essential um, and must be established um, or any changes to data records must be traceable. Um, so there are a few critical aspects um, we normally address at the very beginning um, and we will also talk about it during our initial um, telephone con conference or video conference um, so that everyone is aware of, of these uh, red flags um, and critical aspects. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, we've had another question come in, um, and this is more around the, the difference between the quality label and the self-assessment. So Thomas, um, directing this one towards yourself, um, why would a supplier do the quality label versus the, the self-assessment tool? Yeah, I think there are a couple of good reasons why that should be done. Um, the self-assessment tool, of course, is, is very useful and is a good first step. But I believe it's it's always good to have an outside view. Yeah. So if you have an external party coming in that uh, looks at your at your processes, um, there is a there's a good chance that that party will uh, have a different view from from your own and uh, can give advice. You know, on where things could change. Again, this is not meant to be a policing exercise. I would see this more as a peer review, as a collegial visit. Yeah, and um, to help you improving the processes that um, are already in place or possibly missing. So I think the external view is one important aspect. And the other important aspect, and Christoph already mentioned this, it's about uh, promoting uh, the quality work that you're doing. So it is giving visibility. Yeah, um, It's nice to say, well, I have um, done the self-assessment, but uh, I think it's different if you can say um, I'm accredited by equipped. Yeah, I would like to draw the analogy to the ALAC process, even though I, I have to clearly mention that we are not ALAC uh, uh, status as yet. Yeah, but uh, I believe that uh, for uh, pharma companies, it is very attractive if you can say that uh, you have um, an equipped accreditation. You uh, because you use essentially say that you adhere to certain quality expectations. And I mean, this was, I think, the, the, the reason why the project got quite a bit of traction and why so many pharma companies joined the effort, you know, because many companies outsource nowadays. And uh, it's not only the published literature where we see um, issues with reproducibility, but also, of course, the outsourced work should be at the highest quality standards. And having an equipped quality label helps to make the point that you adhere to these good practices. Thank you, Thomas, for, for that clear explanation. And, and following on from that, um, regarding the, the, the self-assessment quality label, is that more tailored towards a, a commercial CRO or commercial supplier um, academia, or, or, or would it be appropriate for both? No, it would be certainly appropriate for both. I mean, this is why we tried to make this flexible and lean, right? because we realize that uh, we have to be very careful not to overburden people, in particular when it comes to academic labs. Yeah? Um, we wanted to give them the flexibility. We wanted not to impact on the freedom of research. That's, that's not our intention. Um, but we wanted to make it a easy to use system um, that, that could be implemented in an academic lab, could be run by PhD students, uh, postdocs, uh, you name it. And, and so I believe it's really applicable to both CROs and academic labs. Fantastic, thank you. Course, in, in, just one last, think... last uh, point here. Uh, I think also that reflects reality in, in, in the world of, of pharmaceutical industry, because um, of course, it's not only outsourcing to CROs, but also to a lot of, of academics nowadays. Sorry, Christoph, did you want to add something there? 
Yeah, just very quickly. So as Thomas mentioned um, at the beginning, we have assembled um, a stakeholder group of over 100 um, interested parties. Um, and, and here we are not only talking about academic scientists, um, pharma companies, but really we are, we are trying to bring as many different interest groups um, to the table. Um, could be editors, journals, um, public funders, um, it could be technology transfer offices, um, even venture capital investors. Um, so basically everyone who has an interest in preclinical data quality is um, more than welcome to, to work with us. Thank you for that. Um, so one's just popped up on the screen that's, that's caught my eye, so I'm gonna jump straight to that one. Um, so, so I'll open this to you both, um, possibly Chris, uh, Christoph, this may be more appropriate for yourself, but how does the certification work if there are multiple vendor sites? Do they all have to fulfill the requirements and each be in inspected? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so what is important for us is to define what is the research unit um, we assess? Um, if it could be a very small research unit, a couple of scientists, it could be very, very big. Um, but for us, it's important to understand who will be covered by the assessment or by the equipped quality system. Um, 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 who are the scientists um, working under equipped? Um, which kind of experiments and models um, are covered um, by that? Um, so this is for a critical question. Um, and uh, we can we can easily address this question um, um, by a short um, telephone conference. Um, so yeah, this is this is really critical for us to understand what is the research unit um, we assess. Thank you for that, Christoph. And actually, there's another one coming, uh, and they may have just missed part of your presentation. But can you just reiterate? Um, is there a cost uh, to completing the self-assessment piece? No, so the self-assessment is uh, freely available and uh, can be filled out uh, at no costs, no. And just to clarify as well, from the, from the scientist.com perspective, you, if you elect to complete the self-assessment through the platform, then, then again, there is absolutely no charge. It's, it's freely available and you can download the results of that and share it with, your, with uh, any, any of your customers who aren't available on the platform. Um, Another one that's come in that's a little bit probably, I think I'm probably going to have to answer this one, which is um, what is comply uh, that was mentioned. So, so just to, to provide a, a very quick um, introductory summary, um, what we term as comply is our, is our compliance suite that's built within scientist.com that's been designed to support the um, sourcing of, of regulated or controlled services um, from, from third parties by the by biopharmaceutical companies. Um, the whole premise behind comply is around increasing visibility, traceability, and control. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, visibility proactively to information that is being uh, that's critical for a, for a biopharmaceutical company to be aware of before they work. Um, traceability around uh, having complete transparency around the discussions, um, what the deliverables are, the specifications of the project. And then ultimately the control aspect is enabling a, an organization to ensure that before a project is sourced, that the correct approvals have been sought um, from the various different parties. So, so comply has been utilized, uh, or part of comply has been utilized to support the equipped initiative as we've gone through today. But we also have areas of comply that look after the human biological sample acquisition, animal welfare, biomarkers, um, chemistry manufacturing and controls, et cetera. Um, and that's available to all of the suppliers and all of the clients free of charge through the, through the scientist.com portal. So we've had another question uh, just appear. So that's caught my eye because I'm working down the list. Um, will the self-certification be visible to sponsors as well? Um, I can take that, but I'll defer to Christoph or Thomas. Do you want to take that first? No, oh, please go ahead, Mid. Yeah, so, so when you submit, so certainly on the scientist.com platform, um, when you submit the, self, uh, the, the, the equipped uh, request for information, that is visible, the, the results of that are visible to the, to the clients of scientist.com. They have to be logged in, it's, so it, is, it isn't made available to the wider public. Um, it's only accessible by clients who are, who are part of the scientist.com platform. 
Um, as I mentioned in my last answer, you are able to download it as well. Uh, and then you can share it with any of your other customers that you may have that, that aren't on scientist.com. Um, I believe, and I'll defer to Christoph and Thomas, but I think this is self-explanatory, which is if you decide to elect to use the offline version um, or, or the access the version through the Equip Toolbox, then you have full control who has access to that. Yes, correct. This is correct. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so there's... Oh, Thomas, did you want to add anything there? No, yeah, no, I think it's very complete. No worries. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions left. Um, again, if you'd like any more questions to be asked to the team, feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. Um, this one, Thomas, uh, just to direct it to you. Um, could you provide a, a current status of the Equipped Consortium, please? Yes. So the Equipped Consortium is currently funding by, funded by, by the uh, European Union um, as part of an IMI initiative and uh, that uh, ends in September this year. Uh, we have made contingency plans and have just found uh, are, in, are in the process of found, funding, founding a, a society uh, called the Governors of Equipped um, which uh, will take over um, the, the job of, of looking after the quality system. Uh, we have uh, defined an operational arm that will conduct the assessments and we have uh, the society core team that uh, will be involved in the strategy setting, future planning, uh, improvements of, of the quality system, dissemination and, and, and uh, also uh, teaching events. So that's the current situation. So the, the system as such will continue and uh, I think the, the uh, oversight of the quality system is also ensured in the future. Thank you very much, Thomas, for that. And, and lastly, um, Christoph, would you be able to provide a little bit of insight into the different areas covered by the assessment, just to give the, the attendees a bit of a feel for, for what would fall in, in scope for the um, quality assessment? Uh, yes. Um, so. What we do in general is that we try to identify risk factors, um, which could potentially lead to a biased research outcome. Um, and then we look for what kind of protective measures are in place to prevent this from happening. Um, so, uh, for example, we look in detail at the study de design phase of experiments and studies. Um, so I mentioned randomization already. What about blinding? Um, are exclusion inclusion criteria pre-specified? Um, has a power analysis been performed um, related to the right sample size, as, as Thomas mentioned at the very beginning? Um, I also mentioned traceability and documentation before. So good documentation practices, um, that's certainly a key area we are looking into. Um, Related to the whole quality culture, um, does a reward system exist to reward positive data, for example? How are negative data handle, handled? Um, is there short long-term storage um, for data insured? For what type of data is long-term storage insured? Um, so these are yeah, examples of, of areas um, we will cover during the assessment. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, with that last question and answer, I think we're gonna wrap it up for today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you to, once again, to Thomas and, and Christoph for the very informative presentations. Um, if you have any additional questions, then you will see on the screen, uh, you'll be able to get in touch with either scientist.com uh, equipped or pass directly uh, through the through email addresses located. We've also included a link to the equipped toolbox uh, that, that was discussed throughout the presentation. With that, thank you again for joining us and we hope you found the presentation useful. Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you.